Holy smokes, this man builds a giant computer in his home. It's a 16-bit mega processor, 14,000 individual transistors, and 3,500 LED lights. It's going to have seven panels like the one they're picturing here when it's finished. How about that? The cost is costing about $20,000, he's told the BBC News. Mr. Newman said he hoped it would have education of value, but it would be hard to transport as well as likely to weigh about half a ton once he's finished. Bits of the processor light up as they operate, but other than that, the entire machine operates the same as a standard chip-sized microprocessor found in all computers. <clears throat> I was taken by the idea of being able to see how the thing works, Mr. Newman said. I have a visual way of thinking about things. I want to be able to see how a computer works and see how things flow around with it. I intended this as a learning exercise, and man, have I learned a lot. The processor that powers the Michigan Micro Note, the world's smallest computer, is a fraction of the size of a penny. He said that is it, that's the, <clears throat> they're saying this in a, in, a, in a capture here. He says he's now relying on determinedness to get through it. Uh, he says he is concerned about the space the processor takes, which is about two meters high. He says when it's set up, it takes up the entire living room. There's not much space left for living. <laughs> One of his fantasies is to line the hallway with it. My friend think thinks I'm mad. They're also slightly jealous that I allow myself to do it. Look at that. He's building a 16-bit computer. Oh, my God. If he can run Linux on there, uh, he should come on the show. Wow. That makes me feel like I, now that is a summer project that somebody should send into the faux show. Like, that makes me feel like my summer projects are kind of lame. This guy, it's going to take him a long time to build something like that, but that is so neat. And to see it light up as the computer works, man, that's Star Trek. I want that. Now, uh, Wimpy, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to ask this question and imply that you're old, but you've been around for a while, watching the Linux scene for a while. <laughs> okay, I hope you don't take that the wrong way. Uh, and I wonder. I'm sure, if, there's a compliment <laughs> yeah, bursting and, to get out. Well, and I'm here, sure Chris. you well, you have keen observational skills of of the landscape, and I'm sure that with your keen observational skills, have you noticed every year or two? Maybe it's just me, but I swear these articles come up like, "What if Linus dies?" And it's like this theoretical piece of what happens if Linus dies? What happens to Linux? And it seems like we're a little obsessed with what happens if Linus dies. Have you seen this? Yeah, it's not the first time I've seen this, yeah. and um, maybe in the first few years it had some credence, but now Linux is just so huge, there's so many mega corporations behind it, there's so many thousands of developers responsible, there's so many subsystem maintainers, I don't want to um, wish an early demise upon of Linux, course, course. but you know, if, if he does have a disastrous diving accident, then... Um, I think we'll all mourn his loss and we'll oh, yeah. all reflect on, on what he's delivered to the world, but Linux will carry on. Isn't that good? And you know what? Linus says just as much, really. Uh, so uh, the reason why I'm, I'm getting to this is because Bloomberg had a piece up over the weekend, and I, I, I totally intentionally ignored the entire article. Even though it was about Linus and Linux, I saw that headline and I went, oh, not this again. Really? Are they just trolling for clicks? Like, is it is it they have it on a calendar and it just they get like a reminder that it's time to write about this? Like, I don't really want to fall for it. So I, at first I ignored it, but I checked it out uh, after after uh, I guess yesterday, yeah, after afternoon, and uh, turns out there's actually kind of an interesting video attached with it. So I wanted to play that for us because maybe you guys might have avoided it, like I did. <laughs> maybe you didn't, but either way, it's got a great interview with Linus, and uh, I wanted to play a little bit of this. The thing I really enjoy about programming is just the fact that you really can tell the computer exactly what to do and it will do what you tell it and nothing more. I don't know, maybe I'm autistic or something, or borderline, but that doesn't happen in normal life. I'm Linus Torvalds. I'm mainly known for being the guy who started and still maintains Linux. The first computer I used was my grandfather's Commodore VIC-20. I think I was 11 or 12. The computer used a, a very traditional language called BASIC. My sister says that the first thing I showed her was the one that everybody starts with when you're doing BASIC is 10 print and you print a string and 20 go to 10 and that's basically saying print that string forever <laughs> she claims that i made it right out sada is the best uh, which 
to me sounds very unlikely because we weren't necessarily always the best of friends, but maybe I was trying to be nice and impress her with my programming skills. <laughs> it didn't start out very serious, but by the time I was 15, that was what I did. You see code, you don't have to even think about it. You, you look at something and you know what it does. If you're not a programmer, you would think it's almost noise. But if you've been doing it a long time, you can read it like any other language. You can write code that looks beautiful, but just doesn't actually solve the problem. Which is why I'm still doing the same project 25 years later. <laughs> it's, it's because it's, it's hard to write good code. <laughs> Well, I think the big takeaway uh, from that interview, of course, obviously, is that uh, Linus Torvalds uses GNOME 3. No? Did you guys pick up anything else? I thought that was a good chat. He's very... I like Linus. He's turning into a very nice, wise old man. Not old, though. I mean, I gotta stop that. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think Linus has ever been an apologist for uh, for anything that he's done or, or how he behaves and conducts himself. He, he is who he is, and he just... He's just accepted that, and he expects the rest of the world to accept it as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this was one of the reasons why I found that whole cold, uh, code of conduct you know, um, episode a little bit um, disappointing. Because, you know, how many, how many open source projects have still got the, the founder at the helm after 25 years? Hmm. And um, he is still at the helm of Linux. And uh, a no sock puppet, I don't have a clean desk. You've got no idea. When I had to do the UOS thing, I had to put blankets over all of the crap behind me. <laughs> um, and uh, the code of conduct, I felt, was you know unfortunate for, for, for not Linux so much, but Linux as a whole, because <clears throat> that sort of anarchic um, quality of Linux that has made it what it is, was kind of being threatened a little bit by that, but it hasn't really come to anything. Interesting. Since. You're right. You're right. You're right. No, actually, I don't know. I feel like it did sort of something did sort of shift a little bit. Um. Really? Have we heard anything about it since? No, but oh well, kind of. So Greg K H wrote up. Uh, you know that. So he wrote up that quote of conduct, right? Uh, and I feel like, well, I don't know. You know, here's here's what I here's what I w wonder is if maybe we're just not asking for them just to conduct things behind private doors right like if that's not eventually what the what the end result will be is they would they'll just move the discussion to some sort of private like they'll still keep important stuff public but you know what i mean like it probably already happens to some degree i suppose i don't know i'm i guess i'm not totally willing to say nothing's come of it i don't know though it, i feel like uh, i feel like you're touching on something there that is actually really bothersome to me though uh um, like there's sort of like a, 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 a like sort of like a fire he brings to uh, to the project, and if you dampen it out to make it more palatable to everybody, sort of what makes it sort of that edge and makes it special kind of goes away. Is what you're saying? Yeah, I I, I do. Um, I'm not I'm not talking necessarily about um the way that some of the developers conduct themselves and how their um, relationships and messaging toward other people of their community <clears throat> are constructed but it's more about uh, how Linux as a whole was created and emerged and unlike Unix which was there's this core base system that works in harm harmony and unison. Right. Linux was we're just going to grab all these bits and stitch it together and and make a system like Unix. Which on the face and of it, it is it, so is like looking back at it like no one will ever use that for anything serious. That's that's going to be so haphazard. <laughs> yeah, and you know I think now what we we're, we're we're twenty odd years in. And now it's things like Docker and Core OS and containers that are trying to sort of rationalize and consolidate that, for want of a better description, mess into something predictable that you can then 
put your mess into into sandboxes. Yeah. So um, and what was know, announced? Um, what was announced uh, yesterday? What was announced yesterday is that Docker, uh, Core OS, Azure, EC2 folks. Uh, I mean, like a lot of the industry, including the Linux Foundation, are standardizing on some of these container and runtime specs. Uh, so it's funny. Containerization is exactly what you just said, Wimpy. It's, just, it's bringing some sort of order to all of this quote-unquote chaos. And, and who's in the best interest is that is these big commercial companies because they want to be able to deliver products on this platform now. And when they want to be able to deliver products, they want to be able to deliver them in a way that makes them money and in a way that they can reliably reproduce. And so here comes containers. Now, containers are here for lots of reasons, but now all of a sudden, all these different various interests working together like this, all kumbaya style, uh, all of a sudden, it became a lot of people's best interest to sort of solve this problem under Linux, and it's coming at us really fast. Yeah, and um, it's being solved for the right reasons. I know you mentioned that you wanted to talk about um, the Chrome package having, uh, you know, being able to download a blob. Mm -hmm. And it's the very fact that, you know, whilst you're installing a package, that package has root over your system during the install process. So consequently, um, that package, had it been submitted by a Debian maintainer to Debian, it probably wouldn't have passed through the FTP masters because they would have spotted this behavior and would have stamped it out and wouldn't have allowed it in. But just because it's a deb package doesn't mean that it can't do things that it shouldn't because that deb package is distributed um, by um, uh, Google, you know, for Google Chrome. Uh, and uh, Chromium kind of got tainted with it. But um, the containerization and things mm -hmm. like snappy uh, snap packages and click packages and the other similar technologies that will emerge in due course are all about not giving the package root uh, during the install so that it is completely sandboxed. Here's what I find interesting about this is um, it's definitely in some distributions best interest to really be on board. Like it's, there's, there's an obvious reason why Canonical wants to invest in Ubuntu Snappy and why uh, Red Hat's looking at Project Atomic and all of these, all of these things, right? I don't totally grok what the incentive is for the 100% community-based distros or distros that don't really have a large commercial presence. What's their benefit for following suit like this? What, why, why, why should Arch ever want to transition to a transactional-based package system, right? Or, <clears throat> or Debian mainline? Like, I wonder if we're going to start to see a new division among the distributions here, <clears throat> more so than um, enterprise versus personal distro. It's possible. It's very early days. Um, I'm. I've just. Well, having spoken to some of the developers for um, for, for Snappy um, and Snap packages and Click packages, and tried to learn about it and understand it, I've come to the conclusion I just need to sit on the sidelines and watch what happens for this development cycle, mm. and then learn from what comes out of that and use that as reference material. Because it isn't clear to me at the moment whether this is solving a problem that you know someone like me doesn't need to solve, or if there is some uh, value. I can uh, one potential value I can see is as somebody that works on a desktop environment, actually packaging up the desktop as lots of discrete packages, and in some cases, taking something that we spit out upstream. Um, and then splitting that into multiple packages, you know, uh, with the suffix common, the debug symbols, the headers for dev, the, you know, the different um, applications, but based on what, you know, audio library they may use. Um, just being able to say, right, here's the Mate desktop 1.10.0, the whole thing. And you just install this one thing and this one thing arrives as one lump. And when there is an update, you just get the whole of 10.1. Uh, mm. um, and it would be much easier for the upstream package maintainers to actually roll out 
whether they're snaps or atomic packages or whatever it might be, it would be easier to actually just shift the whole right. desktop environment out as a, as the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, boy, Ooh, that would be awesome. <clears throat> and North Ranger, you wanted to make a comment about how the Linux Foundation's uh, involvement is key here. Yeah, I think if you look back at the uh, history of um, Linux distribution, um, there's always been this um, separation based on hmm. packaging formats. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, I mean, you mean like between Deb and RPM distros? Exactly. Um, and those were always driven by the distributions, whereas the community development Linux in general, they just focused on the kernel and didn't get involved. Well, Linus, Greg, Crow, KH, they work for the Linux Foundation. They're now involved in this uh, container consortium. Um, so are they going to be the voice of the community uh, to try to rationalize what all of these different corporate interests are? Yeah, I mean, because <clears throat> there are some very conflicting interests here. When I was looking at the list just a little bit while we were chatting, I, I, I mean, to, first of all, I'm really, really happy to see CoreOS uh, get some play here because uh, they had a really good spec. They came up with some, some good stuff, and I'm really <clears throat> pleased to see that uh, the Docker Docker guys didn't just be like, ah, <clears throat> screw that, we got to do our own thing. Like they're all kind of working together, so uh, that's really awesome. I'm glad that's starting to happen. I don't know how I don't know I don't know how that happened behind the scenes. I'm trying to find out all the different companies that were involved with this uh, project, but it's yeah, it's pretty massive. Docker, CoreOS, Google, Microsoft, Amazon <clears throat> are some of them. I'm I'm looking at the TechCrunch article right now. By the way, if you didn't know. DockerCon was this week. Uh, we talked about it on Coda Radio. At, um, I think it's 159, 158. <clears throat> is this Monday's Coda Radio? Google, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, CoreOS, HP, Wahi, IBM, Intel, Joynet, Cisco, EMC, Apricia, Fujitsu Limited, Red Hat, VMware, Pivotal, Rancher, Metasphere, and others are all in this coalition. Holy shit. Goldman Sachs is even in there? I mean, Google, Google, Microsoft, Docker, and CoreOS got billing, but the fact that Cisco and Red Hat and VMware and Intel and IBM and HP and EMC and Cisco are in there? Well, I think this is sort of a done deal, isn't it? So Linux's Docker, stan Docker container standards, I think, I think we have it, ladies and gentlemen. We have it. And there's other ones out there. I mean, there are definitely other ones out there. I, mean, I think even Canonical has their own. But, wow, that, how do you, wow, how about that? <clears throat> so, uh, CoreOS and Docker are going to work together uh, and other stakeholders on the Open Container Project, which will be housed under the Linux Foundation. The OCP is a nonprofit organization that has charted to establish common standards for software containers. The Docker container format and runtime will form the basis of the new standard. So I want to read that again because that's the important part. The Docker container format and runtime will form the basis of the new standard. And Docker is donating both the draft specifications and the code around its image format and runtime engines to the project to get it started. That's awesome. Uh, so, uh, yeah, wow. With the announcement of the Open Container Project, Docker is telling the world that they are open to this discussion. CoreOS founder Alex Pivil writes, Today, Docker is the de facto image format for containers, and therefore it's a great place to start as a standard. We still feel that there are many technical issues ex existing in the Docker format, but having a neutral seat at the table will help address these from the industry overall. That's coming from the CoreOS guy. <clears throat> For Docker, this means giving up a bit of control after receiving feedback from the community partners and consumers, I mean customers. We, will, we believe the timing is right to create a common standard that the world and will for the world and will ensure compatibility and encourage innovation throughout the ecosystem. Sort of, as a Docker's, Docker's open source initiative guy. Uh, wow, so there you go. That's a huge deal, and that just developed this week. This is Linux Unplugged, episode 98 for June 23rd, 2015. Welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that is just going to live with its caffeine addiction, okay? My name is Chris. Episode 98 is going to be a fun episode. I was putting it together today, and I realized 
Man, parts of this are really scratching and itch. Something that feels familiar, but I haven't been there in a while, a place I haven't visited. Uh, well, I realized kind of has a bit of a system admin bent to it, a little bit. Uh, we're going to cover a couple of uh, couple of interesting bits of feedback that have come in from the audience first in the show. Then a really cool way to deploy Linux throughout your network very simply, very powerfully, without a lot of work. We're going to talk about that. And then that kind of started to stoke that sys admin fired me. So to kind of uh, to kind of finish that off, we're going to bring on, uh, I think his name is James or Jim. We have, the, we have an interview with uh, somebody from the Openoid project. Now, this is a fascinating development. It's like, it's going to make system administration, it's going to bring it to a whole new level. It's going to make it so much easier. Uh, for those of you out there that have a couple of systems to manage or work with virtualization, from like a couple of boxes, maybe I'm talking like two to thousands, this is a really fascinating solution. Uh, Noah had a chance to run, with, run in with him at Linux Fest and sat down. Got a demonstration of how this software works, how the project works, what the UI looks like, how you can roll back machines across your network. Really cool things. We'll show that in today's episode. Really neat stuff. And then later on, towards the end of the show, we've got to talk about this binary blob that Chromium was downloading to turn on your microphone. Yeah, you probably heard about this. And uh, is this the line? Have we finally crossed that line? We're going to talk about that with the mum room in a little bit. So we got some stuff to get into. So why don't we do the first thing? We got to do the first order of business. Let's bring in that virtual lug. Time appropriate greetings, mumble room. Good evening. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Greetings. Good evening. Hello. And welcome to episode 98 of the Linux Unplugged program. So this article was submitted into the show today. <clears throat> and it kind of made me go, oh, yeah. Yeah, what about that? And so I started a poll, and then I'm going to uh, submit to the uh, chat room here. And uh, as I start to ask this question, and I'll start with you, Mumble Room, since uh, you are uh, on immediate feedback. Is anybody in the room right now using Linux on the desktop with a touch device? Now, I'm not talking about your phone. I'm not talking about Android. Are you using Linux, like a distribution that we all know, connected to a touch device of somehow? And I just put a straw poll in the chat room. Uh, I would like you to vote. Now, I actually am not. I used to have a connection to the Bonobo, but for the moment, I do not. So I just voted no. While those votes come in, uh, I was pointed over to this article at uh, maketecheasier.com. And uh, this is, what What are the best Linux desktops have touchscreen support? And this guy rounds up, and he says, uh, GNOME is number one. Unity is number two. I'm not sure why. Uh, and he goes through and gives different uh, tips on how to make them even more touch-friendly. But in here, he says, when it comes to touch, Linux still has a long, long way to go. With touch-screen-based touch -based computers becoming incredibly popular, it's never been more apparent that Linux developers need to step up their game. And remember, GNOME and Unity were both very much built around touch. Unity has great touch support. Plasma and Plasma Active have great touch support. So, uh, anybody in the mumble room right now using a touchscreen? Anybody? On one computer, yes. And Wimpy? Uh, on is, one computer. Okay, one uh, one computer, like laptops, guys? Yeah, Chromebook. Do you... I, um, I've got an old Dell Mini 9 that I bought a touchscreen kit for and retrofitted a touchscreen onto just to experiment with. Yeah. And that's the only, it's the only one with a touchscreen. I bought a Dell touchscreen to experiment with, and I like it. Um, but you know, it is, uh, I, I, I feel like it's, I don't feel like it's unfair to say that like GNOME was pretty much designed around the concept that touch was going to take over the desktop. And I, I feel like here we are in 2015 and that seems like that was a bad bet. That was a really, and in fact, some of the best stuff that's been brought to GNOME has made it more appropriate for a standard desktop. And when you look at what Red Hat ships, they ship GNOME Classic essentially. And if you look at our straw poll right now. 94% of the votes are no on touchscreen. 6% of the votes, yes, on touchscreen. So what the hell happened? What went wrong? I don't think that the input and output device can be the same thing. It's just never going to work. It's just simply a fact that this, this type of computer is just better with mouse and keyboard. I don't know about that, but yeah, maybe. Like, it, it, one thing well, I know that I don't like having my hand in front of the content, is that what you mean? Yeah, exactly. Ah, yeah. yeah. How, 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 are you, how are you making or consuming content whilst your grubby mitts are <laughs> all over it? Right. Um, 
And that's not to say that, you know, obviously, you know, phones and tablets have been very popular, but we're now starting to see a, a drop off on tablet adoption and people now starting to buy computers again. And I think that everyone's learned where a computer has its place, a traditional computer with a keyboard and a mouse, hmm. and where a tablet has its place. And I think maybe the keyboard and mouse are have got um, their days are numbered. But I think we'll just find better ways for interacting with computers for those people that are making stuff. You know, whether you're a computer programmer or a musician or a graphics designer, I think there will be, be better tools coming along for us to use. And maybe we'll transition to using uh, tablets as a display device connected to these other devices for creating content, hmm. but then also use that screen disconnected from those devices um, for consumption of content. Do you, Wimpy, think that this failed bet on uh, touch on the desktop is the, is sort of... Are we seeing blowback from that in, in, in sort of the form of the adoption of Ubuntu Mate? No. You don't no. think so? You don't think people... I think GNOME <laughs> no. 3 and Unity went too far in the touch direction and people wanted a more traditional desktop and I think that I think that bears out in the response to Ubuntu Mate. I think that the people that were going to use Ubuntu Mate were already using distributions like Ubuntu Mate before I came along with with that. Um, I think you've got people that Oh sure, I mean uh, yeah, yeah. I'm but prepared I, to uh, maybe a better way to say it is it's a uh, that way. I'm not saying it's the uh, no, okay, maybe I'll put it this way. It's sort of a land of salvation, then. How about that? Yeah, but it's 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 no different from any of the other distributions that have been out there. So Zubuntu, um, KDE to a large extent, and Kubuntu, uh, and all of the Linux Mint um, uh, versions, they yeah, all yeah. cater towards Fair that enough. you know mm -hmm. traditional desktop mm -hmm. metaphor. Mm -hmm. Ubuntu Mate is not doing anything different in terms of the general user interface we've got a couple of little tweaks and tricks and what have you but um, every distribution has to have something that separates it from from the rest of the crowd I think I think um, we'll see more touch I mean I've got friends that have got computers with touch screens and they do uh, and run Linux and they do use the touch screens but not as the primary way that they interact with the computer so they use the touchpad they use the keyboard but when they say go to shut the computer down and it pops up the prompt do you want to restart reboot or log off they actually touch the button on the screen for you know log, log off reboot and things of that nature so they use it for a few sort of interactions but not as the main right. way that yeah. they actually drive the sure. device yeah so more of a convenience for something. that's how i see angela using her yoga is sort of like it's like a you know every now and then she'll unlock the screen that way or move a window really quick or scroll something yeah. as just like a random way to just interact with it and um my my touch screen that i've got on my uh device is resistive so it's kind of um kind of antiquated but I could see that if you were looking at uh, map data, for example, it would be easier to move around a representation of a map on a computer with a touchscreen by using the touchscreen because we've got accustomed to that on our phones yeah, and yeah, tablets yes, very much, than yeah. using a mouse and keyboard. So there are some applications huh. where it's better. And this is why I think things are going to come along that are better than the keyboard and the mouse. Yeah, good point. I think that is well put. Uh, mini MC, mini mini me C. <laughs> you want to make a point about how resolution on the desktop sometimes matters. Like I have like a two K monitor on my desktop. Yeah, it's a question of finger size. I mean, if you have a full HD uh, display with a normal laptop, it's it's very easy to to. It's not easy to find the points really to touch on the screen, but with a bigger resolution like. Uh, the one I have now, it's it's better. It's working somehow. It's not a full HD resolution I have. So the uh, touch targets are a, bit, a little more friendly. Finger, yeah, more, finger much friendly. more friendly. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Well, how, uh, how do you want to uh, kill an application if you have to point at that X and you don't don't touch that X at the right yeah, corner and it doesn't yeah, close? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that does make sense. And the icon launchers are going to be more like towards the the, the size of your fingers. So that way, so when you're nubbing it, it you're hitting it dead, dead on. It's an interesting thing. I'd like to hear people's feedback, too. Yeah, go ahead. 
So, Chris, did you see Project Soli a few weeks ago? No, what is this? Hang on a second, I shall post it in the chat room. Project Solia? Um, what was it? Huh. It's a, a Google project. Oh, oh, and, oh, oh. Yeah. And when I was talking about new and interesting ways to interact with your computer, this is kind of, um, well, it's um, just amazeballs. Uh, yeah, I think I did actually see this. Uh, this is yeah, that, yes, in fact, I covered this in Tech Talk, I believe. It's extremely fast. Right, it's like it's using really uh, it's using um um um, um Ra radar to yeah. do fine in uh, you know user interaction controls and things of that nature. Fineness of human actions, of fineness of of using our hand, but applied to the virtual world. I love this action. I'm going to play this because this, this is so fascinating. Which is radars to track human hand. I'm doing it the radar has been used for many different things. To track oh yeah, we covered this in last. That's why I know this. This was our runs Linux. Uh, so look at this. Check this out. By the way, they're doing these on MacBooks running Ubuntu, um, and so uh, <clears throat> they have these tiny, tiny devices that are emitting radar, and they're tracking finger movements. And uh, what I love about this is, you know, it's going to work. Oh, that's that one. There's a ThinkPad. You know, it's going to work because uh, they're they're doing the development under Linux. To track cars, big objects, satellites, and planes. We're using them to track micro motions, twitches yeah. of human hands, and then use it to interact with wearables and internet of things. Now and look at this. Devices. And what's great is you get tactile feedback because your fingers are real. Our team is real. focused on <laughs> taking radar hardware and turning it into a gesture sensor. Radar is a technology which transmits a radio wave towards a target, and then the receiver of the radar intercepts the reflected energy from that target. The reason why we're able to interpret so much from this one radar signal is because of the full gesture recognition pipeline that we've built. Woo! The various stages of this pipeline are designed to extract specific gesture information from this one radar signal that we receive at a high frame rate. From these strange foreign range Doppler signals, we're actually interpreting human intent. Radar has some unique properties when compared to cameras, for example. It has very high positional accuracy, which means that you can sense the tiniest motions. We arrived at this idea of virtual tools because we recognize that there are certain archetypes of controls, Look at like that. a volume knob or a, a physical slider, Look volume at that. slider. Look at that. Imagine a button between your thumb and your index finger and uh, the button's not there, but pressing this is a very clear action, and there's a natural physical haptic feedback that occurs as you perform that action. Mm. The hand can both embody that virtual tool, and it can also be you know, acting on that virtual tool at the same time. So if we can recognize that action, we, we have an interesting direction for interacting with technology. Now so, that is a type of interaction that I think makes a lot of sense on a laptop or on a desktop. Imagine just having that built into the casing of the laptop or a keyboard, so there would just be another input method that's, in, that's included in that device. Yeah, I want that. I, I, that's exactly the kind of input method I think that I would love to see come to the desktop or, or laptop. Or phones even, I suppose. Or TVs even. I think, yeah, or, you know, um, equipment, you know, um, your... your uh, I'm going to sound old. DVD player, Blu-ray player, yeah. amplifier. Yeah. You know, uh, instead of having great big ugly knobs on things. Huge for um, VR. This could be huge for VR. Yeah. Wow. Man. That is so cool. I hope Google really. Br I hope that comes to market. You know, sometimes these companies have amazing things in the skunks labs that skunk labs that never make it out. I hope that one makes it out. That's a cool one. Uh, all right, well, we actually have uh, another really cool project that really tugs on my heartstrings uh, that I want to talk about. And uh, I, I, I think, actually, it could be something you could host on a DigitalOcean droplet. So let's start there. Let's talk about DigitalOcean, our first sponsor this week. And uh, I just want to tell you up front, if, if you know about DigitalOcean, grab our promo code DO Unplugged. You'll get a $10 credit. You can try out DigitalOcean for a couple of months for totally free. No credit card required. Now, if you're not familiar with DigitalOcean, they've made some news this week. Uh, it's actually pretty cool. We were talking about DockerCon, right? Well, uh, up on stage, 
they were doing demonstrations of deploying lots of instances of machines uh, with Docker, uh, you know, taking uh, Docker on those machines and then just pushing a container to them. And uh, so he's like, well, the guy is up on stage. He's like, so here's my script, and he starts it up. And I'm going to go and he, you know, it's like a Linux machine that he's creating, and he creates the machine. And now I'm just going to go ahead and deploy it on DigitalOcean. As <laughs> soon as he says DigitalOcean, everybody in the audience started clapping. DigitalOcean got a freaking round of applause at DockerCon. How cool is that? So they, so he deploys it up to DigitalOcean, and then all, he, he spins up like 8, 9, 10, 11 machines all at once up on DigitalOcean. And then the containers get deployed up there, and then bam. And they just started spinning. It was a really cool demo. And I was like, wow, that is the incredible power of DigitalOcean. And what's so neat about that is that's on the high end, right? But uh, it, you can do anything on DigitalOcean, even if you're just like doing it for testing or your own personal system, like an own cloud server or a Minecraft server, DigitalOcean will work for you too. You can get started in less than 55 seconds, and pricing plans start only $5 a month. That'll get you 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. And they have data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, and DigitalOcean just set up a brand new one up in Germany that is nice, 40 gigabit E connections to each hypervisor, their fastest SSDs yet, and that Germany location has really, really good distribution. So if you are doing some self-hosting, if you are maybe, again, if you are, have a podcast that, you know, 10, if you have 10, 15,000 listeners, you could just put your, you could host this up on a few DigitalOcean droplets and you are done. And it is a very elegant solution. I used to do something similar to this. And what we had is a little PHP script that when the users hit that, it would randomize which, which uh, uh, at the time it was a different provider, which server it would pull the file off of and then deliver it. Later on, we had to move on to a, to a different system. But DigitalOcean now with a terabyte of transfer and $5 a month, there's so many things you can do with it. And the great part is their interface to manage all of it is amazing. It's super intuitive and power. You're just going to replicate that control panel on a larger scale with their awesome API like they were showing at DockerCon. And you, that's where you can do your DNS management, take care of your snapshots, one click, yeah, I said one click, yeah, I meant one click, I'm not talking like one click SUSE style where it's actually like 15 clicks, I'm talking one click DigitalOcean style where one click and you deploy the entire LAMP stack on an Ubuntu rig already set up or an, an, an Ubuntu 1404 machine with Docker ready to go or a Fedora rig, they got all of it. It's really cool. And, oh, and by the way, DigitalOcean recently just launched shared resources. I mean, <laughs> team accounts. That way you can share resources and not passwords. Team accounts, yeah, that's going to be nice here at Jupiter Broadcasting. I think that's a smart move by DigitalOcean. Go check them out. Get started in less than 55 seconds. SSD, everything. And use our promo code DO Unplugged. Get a $10 credit. Try out a DigitalOcean rig, that $5 one, two months for absolutely free. By the way, they've got CoreOS now which is a super cool up-and-coming distribution on servers that you might want to get just for two months. Go play with it on some actual production systems. Why not? Also, they have free BSD. Now, I'm not sure why you would do that, but I'm sure you probably have reasons. DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code DO Unplugged. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Linux Unplugged program. All right, well, uh, Mr. Blackout24 in the Linux Action Show subreddit submitted this butter knife link. Butterknife, deploy a customized Linux to hundreds of machines in minutes. Now, you can probably guess why they call it Butterknife, because yes, my friends, it involves ButterFS. Check this out. Butterknife makes bare metal Linux deployment dead simple using the ButterFS file system and containers. Ha ha ha! Yeah, how fancy and buzzwordy can we get? Let's take a whole bunch of new stuff, put it all together, and get yourself a new deployment system, my friends. Uh, so you prepare a template of a customized OS in an LXC container. Brilliant. So you customize your rig up in a, in a Linux container. You brute the provisioning image and deploy a template on bare metal. And you just get her, and then you just set it up, and it's done. Uh, uh, so I have a walkthrough that Blackout24 linked us to. It is literally you'd pull down the butter knife uh, ISO. You you know take care of that. You DD it as you as you would. Uh, you set up a TFTP server uh, using butter knife provisioning image on your LAN. Uh, you replicate your GitHub repository to the TFTP root server. Uh, you boot the machine either from Pixie or a memory stick or CD. And uh, then you follow the, it, it'll, it'll, once it boots off Pixie, it detects uh, the Butterknife server. And then it says, do you, do you want to provision this machine? Do you want to reboot this machine, power it off? You obviously say provision this machine. Then Butterknife wipes the disk, creates a ButterFS file system, downloads the snapshot of the newly created file system on that Linux container you set up, and blasts it onto the machine. And you can do this to deploy live CDs or to a memory stick as well. 
And it's all just right here on this blog, right here, that uh, Blackout24 linked to us with uh, images to kind of do this and, and set it, try it yourself, ready to go. This is really cool. So if you've got like a LAN or if you have some virtual machines and, you know, you just need to be able to, uh, to blast a machine, a uh, standardized machine out to them, this makes, it, this makes it like a four or five step process once you have this set up. This, you got to use ButterFS. And you got to use Linux containers, but this makes it real. This butter knife system makes it really, really, really easy to go into a go into a container, set up a base basic system, and then you can provision that to all your machines. Really cool. So I wanted to say a special thank you to uh, Mr. Blackout. Uh, now, with that said, so that's the fancy way to do it. Wimpy, I'm wondering, do you have any any tricks or methods for like reloading your systems? Do you have like an image you do at home, or when you need to reload, do you just format and deploy? Uh, right. So when I install a system, I install off the Ubuntu Mate ISO image, depending on the architecture of the machine or it's a Raspberry Pi. But the trick that I have is that I use Sync Thing now. Ah. Yay! So Sync Thing, I have um, my profile stored in Sync Thing. So the first thing I do on the new machine is install sync thing. You mean like your your Connect. batch profile, or what do you mean profile? Well, yeah, as in all of all of my profiles. So like all, your, of all your dot, dot folders, all my dot files, dot folders. So there's a utility I use. I'll look up the details and post it in the chat room in a bit. Okay. Um, it's called Macup M A C K U P, and it was originally developed for apple mac users to back up their dot files and what have you to dropbox um and i uh, contributed some initial uh, ports for linux and since the initial it, it was all geared toward dropbox back back when it first started but mm. now it's got um just any directory you can use as the storage Ooh. so i just have uh, a sync thing directory mm -hmm. and it does all of the um you know the uh, sim linking magic so you just restore your sync thing profile um, directory and then in there I run a Mac up restore and then it lays down all of the uh, profiles for me so literally within a minute of installing a machine I've got all of my configuration that I need in place do you and run in into any issues with version differences or it does the, is the key to this approach you reload the same version of the desktop environment the same Chrome or Firefox like is that do you have to manage it in any kind of special way like that I haven't been very careful about it, no. I mean, uh, mostly I'm running Ubuntu Mate 1504 and Arch Linux, and they're all all up-to-date enough that I've not run into any problems. Interesting. Um, but, when you, but when you use MacUp, you can, you know, augment things. You don't have to... You, it, it, it will prompt you and say, do you want to restore this thing? So I do know, for example, that my Bash profile and Arch Linux, I don't want to have common between Ubuntu and Arch, so I, I don't you know, restore that on the uh, Arch machines. Gotcha. So that for is some for example. management, but yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but it, it, pr it prompts me for that because it knows there's already a bash profile there that's different. Um, and the thing. other thing that I've, and the, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I've had some good success with sync thing. I've, I've just started know. using it a bit more aggressively now. Hmm. And um, the other thing that I've been doing recently is that um, deconf, which is um, the, the back end behind G settings, you can dump there's a it's called is deconf and the parameter is dump and there's also deconf load so you can dump uh, all or some trees from deconf into text files and then you can deconf load those tech text files back into your tree so i've got a script that just dumps out the bits of the deconf tree that I know are safe and common between my systems. So things like how I like the file manager configured, how I like right. the text editor configured. Right. And and then I can, you know, just that's part of my Mac up post restore script actually then, you know, lobs all that back in oh, again. Oh God. So you're getting like even like your editor config back the way you want it and stuff. Ev uh, uh, everything. Oh, you know, SSH that's nice. keys, GPG keys all of my application settings. So when I do a restore, I've got my um, uh, hex chat configuration, which actually connects to my bouncer. But nevertheless, you know, there's some config there. And I've got all my mumble, mumble profiles in there and all of my mumble certificates. Ooh. So I run a Mac up restore and on a fresh machine, 
within two minutes, I've got everything I need to get cracking again. Nice. Now, Sean, uh, you say you do something kind of similar with Simlinks and OwnCloud. Can you describe that to me? Well, really, a lot of it's done manually, but basically, you just take and take all your dot dot folders and throw them into your own cloud uh, sync folder, and then you just sim link the individual dot folders uh, from your home folder to your own cloud folder, and then it's just going to keep a hold of it, replicate that on multiple systems if you want to. Okay, and uh, then t when you like launch into a clean install, do you just kind of uh, sort of resim link the ones you want to restore the config from manually, or do you like bash script that, or what's your approach there? Uh, I haven't got into the bash scripting part of it yet. I usually just do the sim linking manually for the ones that I want to have, and then that way I can actually have multiple versions and just kind of rename them and change the sim links that way. I like that. I mean, what I like about yours is yours is a little more surgical in the sense that you're just going to, you know what, I want X, Y, Z restored. I, what I really like, though, is Wimpy's uh, idea about exporting out decomp settings, because I knew it could do that. I know it can do that. I just never do that. Uh, and sometimes I tell myself I don't do it because, well, I like to re-experiment and try something new every time I set up. I want to be free to try something new. But really, I am getting to the point where, like, I kind of always like to have this theme now. For the most part, at least for like six months at a time, I like to use this theme. I like to use this setup. So I don't know. I'm slowing down on that a little bit. Uh, so, so in in my Mac up profile, I have the dot themes directory and the dot icons directory. Yeah, of course. And I just put all of that stuff in there now, and then it's all restored. And including things like you know, I use Genie for my um, ah, development uh -huh, editor, uh -huh. and all of my Genie profiles and syntax highlighting and themes is all in there as well. So I can move from machine to machine now, and I can take. I even even have in sync thing all of my git checkouts which sounds crazy because you can just check git in and out but i <laughs> sync thing all of my checkouts so that if i don't have time mm. to check stuff in on the laptop i was using and i'm upstairs i've just got that uh, that state of where i got to on that machine and i can carry on that's interesting uh and uh, Evil Pickles in the chat room is uh, men is linking uh, GNU Sto as Simlink Farm Manager, which takes distinct packages of software and or data located in separate directories on the file system and makes them appear to be installed in the same place. Uh, so that might uh, work with what you're doing, Sean, is you combine uh, GNU Sto, S-T-O-W, and uh, I'll add a link to that in the uh, show notes, too, if I can remember to do that. Wow, the good setup. Anybody else in the mumble room have uh, any kind of uh, sort of backup or reload techniques they want to share before we move on? I feel like mine are all very uh, clunky and caveman. No. <laughs> Mine's like, Chris, reload. Chris, install Dropbox, own cloud, BitTorrent, sync, and Chrome sync, Chris, done. Mine is not nearly as elegant as Sean's or Wimpy's, and it kind of makes me want to step up my game a little bit. Uh, all right, I've got MacUp linked in uh, the show notes, and right now I'm also linking GNU Sto, which is the uh, Simlink manager. So uh, very good. Thanks, guys. Good, good stuff. I think I'm going to uh, reevaluate uh, uh, my approach. I think I'm going to adopt. Uh, boy, I kind of am tempted, tempted also to play with sync thing now. Thanks, Wimpy. <laughs> I just You're got, you got my head spinning. Uh, all right, I want to get into the Openoid uh, discussion because it really tugs at the heartstrings for me. It's something that uh, I, it's actually kind of funny how I came across this footage. So I, I was reviewing all the footage that Noah uploaded uh, from uh, Southeast Linux Fest, and uh, um, <laughs> I didn't see this clip because he didn't upload it. <laughs> and, but the, but the, uh, the rig, like the big broadcast rig, made it back to the studio because our next live event is going to be at LinuxCon in August, I believe, in Seattle. And so he figured might as well ship it back to the studio so that way it's local. And so I take the rig out and I shake the hard drive out and I found this clip that when Noah had a chance to get away from the booth, he brought the camera with him and sat down uh, and had got this really fascinating interview. So I'm going to roll this because it was like it's like newfound footage from self. Uh, but first, I, I have to tell you about how I've saved two thousand dollars in the last couple of years, more than that actually, by switching to Ting. What? What? Yeah, Ting. Ting is mobile that makes sense. Ting's my mobile service provider, and I am a serious Ting advocate. I, I what I love about Ting is you only pay for what you use. I know. Wrap your brain around that. It's just your minutes, your messages, and your megabytes. After that, you're done. Well, there's a flat six dollars for the for the line and any taxes, but there's no like. I buy X amount of minutes and X amount of messages and X amount of megabytes because I might use them? No, that S is crazy. Ting keeps rates simple. We don't make you pick a plan. Instead, you just use your phone as you normally would. 
how much you use, determines how much you pay each month. You can have as many devices as you want on one account. That's good, because when you use more, you pay less per minute, message, or megabyte of data. Your usage, plus $6 per active device on your account, plus taxes, is your monthly bill. Simple. That's what we mean when we say mobile. That makes sense. What Kyra left out, too, is they have no hold customer service. You call them at one eight five five ting ftw and a real human answers the phone. And when I was talking to them before they even became a sponsor, we were talking about this particular aspect of their business because the way they operate, this is where they can invest heavily, is really good customer service, really, really good dashboards, and rolling out new platform features all the time, like they have mobile apps that integrate with the service. Like This is where Ting totally doubles down. I love this aspect of it because it's super nice to finally get this high level of treatment from a carrier. And so I, you know, I was talking to them, like, how do you choose your service reps? Because you, you know, you're making a big stink out of this. And they said, well, we, at first we, you know, we, we would do the traditional route because we've done it for some of our other companies we've set up in the past. But then what we realized was we were really looking for the Android geeks and the Windows mobile geeks and the iPhone enthusiasts. And when they were that, we would find the people that would always be the tech support of their family or their peer group. And those are the people we wanted to hire. So that way, when you call in, you're talking to one of the people that love this kind of stuff. And that was like, a, I thought, a brilliant insight on Ting's part. And here's what I, here's what I love is right now, uh, if this for a couple of days left until the end of June, this is only going to last a couple more days. You can get $50 off your first Ting device or $50 service credit if you bring your own device. Ting has GSM and CDMA networks, so there's a lot of devices you can bring. They have a bring your own device page to tell you more about that. $50 is a big deal. Go to linux.ting.com to get that. That supports the Unplugged show specifically, but it also gets you the $50 credit. Now, they have MiFi devices. And remember, with Ting's structure, you only pay for what you use. So you could get $50 of credit if you get one of these MiFi devices. That might mean that you're not paying for data for months on this thing. You just have tri-band LTE in your pocket when you need it. That's cool. That's, that's actually very useful, too. They also have, like... Um, Feature phones that are great for emergencies, all the way up to the highest end devices if you want to make it your dedicated line like I do. It's a really great service, and they have really good people working at Ting. Go to linux.ting.com and take advantage of that $50 discount while it lasts. It expires at the end of June. linux.ting.com. And a big thank you to Ting for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. You guys are awesome. I love, love, love my Ting service. And now I'm on the GSM network, too, which is even more awesome. So let's talk about Openoid. Uh, their slogan is, we make systems work. Networks and systems enable every business operating today. We keep them running and make enterprise-level features available to small and medium-sized organizations. All right, that's a pretty badass pitch. Uh, and at first, I was like, okay, that sounds uh, kind of like what I always hear. But uh, Noah was wandering the floors like, uh, like a madman at a Southeast Linux Fest a couple of weeks ago. And like I said, I found this clip uh, with Jim from Openoid. And uh, the sysadmin in me immediately fell in love, and I wanted to share it with you guys. So here we go. Welcome. We're here at Self 2015 and walking around again, like last year, the year before, not many Macs, not many Windows PCs, but a lot of Linux. I ran into Jim and met Jim last year. Now, you remember me from, uh, from inside of the room, but I actually don't recall this story, so you'll have to refresh my memory. So basically, uh, Ryan Gordon, a.k.a. Iculus, uh, he did a presentation on his MacBook, and um, he couldn't figure out how to get it to connect to the projector. And uh, when I walked into the speaker sponsor lounge a little bit later, you were in there having a conversation with somebody very, very vehement about people who brought Macs to conferences, which I, I kind of have an issue with that too, but I try to be a little bit more political about it. But you're just letting it rip. And uh, Ryan walked in in the middle of your tirade, and uh, he, I don't, you didn't recognize him or realize that he was the guy that had flubbed the presentation on the MacBook. And he tried to say a couple of things in defense of bringing a Mac to an open source conference, and you just pretty much ripped his head off and pooped down his neck. Uh, I tend to do that from time to time. <laughs> it was wrong, but hilarious. All right. Well, uh, I have no recollection of that, but it's an amusing story nonetheless. Now you're here, uh, so ripping Windows out of out of out of, off of hardware and putting it on top of a virtualization system um, to get so that you and I, as system administrators, we just deal with the underlying OS of Linux and Windows just kind of sits on top. Uh, that's something we can both get behind, right? Absolutely. So tell me what it is I'm looking at here, and actually what I might do is I might reposition the camera to look at the screen, because you have actually kind of an interesting demo going on. Okay, great. 
Now, uh, don't get sick. He's going to move the... Okay, all right. Blah! Now, Openoid, Open Source Systems Intelligence. That's, not, that's cool. I like okay, that. Okay, so we're looking at a Sanoid machine right here. We're actually looking at... Uh, we've got two machines in a rack, and you can see we're connected to both of them in Vert Manager right here. The one on the top that I'm wiggling around in, uh, this is the production machine, and the bottom machine on the rack is Backup. And at the, at, the, uh, at the base of everything, this is a virtualization platform. And we have Windows Server 2012 R2 virtualized on the platform. And we're looking right here at a Server 2012 VM. Um, the idea behind this platform is we're condensing an entire enterprise virtualization stack with a SAN and a 10 gig fiber transport network and separate compute nodes and all that into a single uh, commodity box running open source software. And um, one of the things that when you tell somebody that, that, the first thing they think is, well, it must be cheap and the performance must be, you know, not as good. That's actually not the case. One of the things that we all love to hate about Windows is having to reboot it constantly. It's very painful. So let's reboot it. And that's really not so bad. We just rebooted Windows in about a second and a half. So obviously performance is not an issue here. But that's actually the least important thing about this. Much more important is... If we drop to the console here, we can see that we're actually looking at a stream of hourly, daily, and monthly snapshots. Sanoid automatically snapshots all the VMs every hour on the hour and uh, on daily and monthly as well. Keeps them, thins them, rotates them out as needed. You don't have to have any hands-on interaction with it. It just does it all for you. And it also replicates. If you look down here, this is our backup box. And you can see we've got the exact same stream of snapshots here on both machines. So what that means is, if you're concerned about, uh, you know, are my off-site backups any good or not, it's actually very easy to find out. Just boot it up and see. So that was pretty easy, and we know that our off-site backup is good. If we're still not convinced, we can actually just log into it and interact with it however we need to to actually demonstrate everything's going on. Now, if you've got sharp eyes, you might have noticed that we've got a shutdown event tracker here. And the reason for that is that the replication is actually crash consistent, not application consistent. I consider that to be a feature, not a bug. So unlike Microsoft's volume shadow copies, there's no services that are forced to quiesce the system before it's replicated. It just gets replicated no matter what. So you can't end up with having like a writer get locked up and you don't get your replications. Nobody wants that. Now, the other thing that I like to do is to look at, you know, what do we do if something goes wrong? So in here, back in our console, we're looking at this 13 gigs. That's actually the storage for our Windows 2012 R2 production box. Well, we hate it. It's gone. We killed it. And we can prove that. We'll force it off. And if we try to start it, you can see we get an error, of course, because we nuked the entire hard drive. Oh no, what do we do? Well, all we do is just look at our available snapshots, and we'll go to our most recent hourly, which was only taken a few minutes ago. So we do a rollback. It's that quick, that easy, that was literally all there was to it. and. We're done. Everything's fixed. So imagine instead of me just arbitrarily deleting the hard drive that had been a user, if you are a sysadmin who has to deal with Windows and its users who clicked the wrong link in email and uh, managed to crypto wall your server up, your recovery is again just that easy. There's no going to tapes or any of all that craziness. You just do a rollback to your most recent hourly and you're up in seconds. Now, uh, this is one of those things. This is one of those things that I would imagine makes your life as a system administrator way easier. And I've, I actually, I, I am a huge advocate of, of Liberty and KVM and of course Vert Manager because the nice thing is it allows me to access all of my client servers from my laptop through SSH uh, and, 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 and everything from top to bottom is Linux. But you have gone one step further and you're actually building these as a hardware solution for your clients. Absolutely. Okay, so tell me about that. If I wanted to buy, like, let's say I, <clears throat> maybe I'm not very technically savvy, you will actually build the system out for somebody and, and send it out and, and, and then they just, they plug it in and you'll manage it for them? Uh, that's correct. Um, there are three base models, a, uh, a small business edition, a standard, and a pro, which uh, differ in uh, how much CPU, RAM, and storage they can handle. 
Um, they sell for a set price without storage. Uh, you can either add storage yourself, or I can also supply them to you with the storage installed. And basically, when you get the box, it's already set up, ready to go. All you have to do is add VMs. Outstanding. And uh, if people wanted to go learn more information about your consulting service or your build service, where would they go? Openoid.net. Outstanding. Thanks so much for taking the time, Jim, to speak with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Really cool. And I have linked in the show notes, too, uh, a link to the code. The policy-driven snapshot management replication tools now currently using ZFS, or ZFS as you uh, Yanks call it, for underlying next-gen storage with explicit plans to support ButterFS. There you go, Sean, when ButterFS becomes more reliable. So, Sean, I saw you say in the chat, I'm like, ah, I can do this with ButterFS. Go ahead, get, get it in there, get it in there, I'll let you. Well, well, you know, it's <laughs> already got it, snapshots, it's, it's there. Yeah, but this is a really cool, like, full front-end UI management tool that I remember back when I was managing a whole bunch of Linux VMs. We didn't quite have anything like this yet, and it was becoming... Uh, I I started... Okay, I don't, know if, I don't know if anybody in the chat room remembers Red Carpet. Does anybody remember a service called Red Carpet that was, like, a patch management system for Linux? Yep. Oh, you do? Oh, Wimpy, can you describe it? Because I'm not... I don't remember it very well. I was just Googling no, it. No, I... I I just remember it from eons ago. I don't think I ever used it in uh, anger. Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to remember. Was it was, was, it, was it not? Was it not for Red Hat specifically? Yeah, and also it worked with SUSE for a bit. Uh, yeah, uh, Red Carpet was the package management system for uh, from the uh, from the Zeminian desktop. Zeminian. Uh, and therefore, Red Carpet is now owned by Novell. Red Carpet supports most of the popular Linux distributions. Uh, it later tended to the Zen Zenworks. Oh man, Zenworks! I did Zenworks management too. Oh man, I remember Zenworks. This is one of the reasons I I I, I switched to SUSE Enterprise Linux. And uh, oh man, Zeminian. Do you remember Zeminian? They were the ones that actually. That's where we got Nautilus from. Uh, they were and called evolution. Helix Code. Yeah. Well, and what? Evolution. Yeah, the evolution mail also, client, right, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it says actually where Zamarian eventually came out of, where, where Mono eventually came out of, and Miguel did all of this. I mean, this company eventually evolved into Zamarian. Um, wow, a lot of history just all of a sudden hit me in the face. And I used, I used a lot of different tools. Red Carpet was the first one I ever used, and I loved it because it was a GTK GUI desktop interface, and it, it used SSH and remote... Um, uh, I can't remember what. It, oh yeah, a little client server system for Red Carpet. So you had to have like a you know a distribution that was supported and had a package available for Red Carpet. But once you did that, you, from one spot I could uninstall packages. I could install updates for all of the distributions. One GTK app on my desktop for like six months. I was in patch management utopia. And eventually, Red Carpet went away. And I couldn't keep up with the pace of development of distributions. This was an early lesson for me. Uh, and then I tried something called Zenworks, which uh, was horrible uh, because it was so complicated. And it just sort of spun out and spun out. So now when I see things uh, 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 like Openoid or like Butterknife that we talked about earlier in the show, uh, I just and, and honestly, things like DigitalOcean, I just think it's, it's a new era that makes Linux accessible to just a, a whole new group of people that can deploy these really big systems now and manage them. And like Sean likes to point out, ButterFS is going to be part of that too. I'm, I just get a little excited when I see it. I was a little nostalgic. Uh, <clears throat> Zamarian and Zimian, that boy, that, that really takes me back. Uh, all right, so I, you guys know um, fairly publicly here on the show, uh, I've talked about how I'm a big Chrome and Chromium user. I actually prefer to use Chrome uh, since the Netflix stuff, but I guess now I can do that under Chromium. And uh, thanks to a bug, I believe this is how it started, and I'll, I'll open myself up to correction here in a moment. Um, <clears throat> but I believe thanks to a bug discovered by someone in the Debian project, we now know that Chromium, if you install Chromium, like on Ubuntu or Debian and perhaps other places, once it launches, it downloads a binary in the background that enables your microphone. So that way you can do things like, OK, Charlie, you know, the real, I don't want to activate your phone, but you know what it does. OK, Charlie, what's the weather like today? And then Charlie, a.k.a. Google, comes back and tells you what the weather's like. And this is a search function built into Chrome browser you can turn on and off, and now they've been enabling this. But people get freaked out. I install the Chromium browser, and it downloads this binary. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized this actually might be a really big deal. Because wait a minute, what if it's not even... What if you just remove what the binary does? Not even the fact that it activates the microphone, and the fact that they're doing it secretly in the background without user permission. That, I think, is what gets me. 
You say it could be doing anything. It could be enabling GPU acceleration. It could be enabling faster uh, write to my SSD. But if they're downloading it in the background without my permission and installing it, right there, right there, that seems like where the line gets crossed. Right there. Where it gets into absolutely egregious territory is when that binary turns on my microphone. Because before I give them permission to do that, I would like to know what controls that list. Can other things be added to the OK Google list? Can, can, can hundreds of words be added to that list? Can nothing be added to that list? Is it an encrypted list? Is it editable if I, if I dig around in Chrome settings? How is that managed? What activates that trigger? Before that question is answered, I don't want to install it on my browser. And if they don't even give me the option, they just do it in the background, that's egregious. So is this the line? Or are we the boiling frogs that are going to sit here and say, no, nah, it's not a big deal. It's just not a problem. It's just not a big deal. So I want to talk about that with the mumble room. But first, I want to talk about Linux Academy. I love Linux Academy because I see a lot of what inspires me in them. People that are truly passionate about Linux and open source and about the community coming together to create something that they think they're going to love. <clears throat> That's what really Linux Academy is about, is true enthusiasts in Linux and open source coming together with developers and educators, creating the Linux Academy platform. Seven plus Linux distributions you get to choose from for any of the courseware that they have. And then that automatically defines the, the VPS that they're going to spin up for you on demand when the courseware requires that, which is really cool because that means you're actually SSHing into a server, you're installing these things, you're configuring these things, and you're checking for real, wor real world results. That means when you go do this in production, it's not the first time you've messed with this stuff. It's not just concept. That's a, that closes the gap. That's a, that goes from uncanny valley knowledge to you actually know what you're doing. And I really like that it's self-paced courses. And this, this comes through in a lot of ways, from your availability selection where you say, I'm available for one hour on Monday, one hour on Wednesday, and three hours on Sunday, and then it just automatically generates you some courseware, that's also really great. But they have over 1,549, I think that number's even gone up since uh, they've updated this video, uh, that you can go through and watch entire courses on. That is some serious content, let me tell you. I know what it takes to produce that many videos. And they have scenario-based labs where you really work with common tasks in an everyday environment. In these advanced labs environments, you'll complete these scenarios from beginning to end on live servers. That's extremely handy. They have great new courseware for the Red Hat course stuff. They have, op they have the best OpenStack, the best Docker materials. They have stuff for Ruby, Python, PHP, Android development, basic Linux courseware, IP tables. In fact, if you just need to refresh a few skills, check out their nuggets. I love this. <clears throat> They're always adding new nuggets all the time. Like they have some up here for AWS. So if you're working with the Amazon Web Services, here's how to create a snapshot bash backup script. Some virtual box nuggets. Building a firewall with IP tables. This is really cool because these nuggets are last anywhere from six minutes to, I don't know, an hour. And it's just a single topic. You go in there, you deep dive on this topic, you get more efficient on that topic, and you're done. This is another way you get value out of Linux Academy. So go to Linux Academy, won't you? In fact, get our special 33% discount when you go to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. That'll give you our 33% discount. Get in there, try it out. See it for yourself. Get a nice discount while you try it. See if it works for you. You can be the best judge to see if it helps you become a little more competitive. Maybe gets you a little bit more on that next review or helps you land that next job or give you a bit of a confidence boost or just check Challenge yourself. LinuxAcademy.com slash unplugged. And a big thanks to Linux Academy for sponsoring the Unplugged Show. You guys, keep up the great work. Okay, so anybody want to jump in first on this Chrome topic? Uh, to me, it seems like this is the line too far. Uh, and here's, I, I already told this story, so I'll keep it brief, but I, here's what made me realize this. Um, let's see, uh, it was uh, Father's Day. I was seeing family. And uh, this family, it was a couple, they have two S4, uh, Samsung S4 phones. You know, a couple years old now because the S6 is out, right? And, and before, they, before they installed this update they got, they wanted to come see me. So I look at their update, oh, it's Lollipop. Oh, good, you guys are going to get Lollipop. Great, great, yeah, this is a good update. You're really going to like Lollipop. Let's do it, install it. So we plug in their chargers, we hit the update. It takes like an hour because it's got to update all their apps too. <laughs> it says it's going to take 30 minutes. <laughs> it does not take 30 minutes. And it updates all their apps. Well, one of the new apps it gives them is Google Photos. Oh, okay, Google Photos. All right, cool. So I'm showing them, well, I've got Google Photos on my on my phone. Let me show it to you. And I bust it down. I'm like, this right here is Google Photos, and it is so great. And I do not have time to tag and organize my photos, and I don't ever manage it. And this just automatically backs them up to Google servers for me and unlimited storage. And I'm just going into the whole thing, talking about how great it is. 
And look at this, I say. And I bust out the search feature, and I'm like, it's tagged every person's face. And look, this is, it knows this is food, these are flowers, that's an object, that's a car, that's a whatever, a holiday. Like, it's gone through and figured all this stuff out. And I'm like, <clears throat> so check this out. And I hit the search button, and I say, show me all the pictures of my son Dylan at Christmas. And I like, and check this out. I've never tagged any of these photos. And the Google Photos app instantaneously, bop, 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 auto-populates the search results. Here's all the pictures with Dylan at Christmas. <clears throat> And I'm like, isn't that awesome? Isn't that great? I never told it this is Christmas. I never told it this is Dylan. It just figured all that out by importing my pictures. And and they look at me like, like I am an, a crazy person. Like they look at me like, so how does it know that's Dylan? And I'm like, well, it, it looks at the face. So it knows the faces of everybody you take pictures of? Yeah. So it knows everybody you ever hang out with that's in your photos? Yeah. <clears throat> and I won't say this guy. Let's just call him. We'll just call him Jim. And they say to me, they say, well, what about your buddy Jim? He, he intentionally, like, it's his, per, it's his mission in life never to have a presence online. He never, he never wants to be tagged in any photos. He doesn't have a Facebook profile. He doesn't have a Twitter account. He doesn't have a Google account. Like, <clears throat> what about him? What about Jim? He's in some of your photos. I'm like, oh, yeah, Jim is in some of my photos. Like, so now Google knows that you hang out with Jim, even though Jim never wants to be online. I, yeah, I guess. And so I, I expected them to be like, oh, man, this is going to be so convenient. I, now I don't have to worry about managing my photos, and I don't have to worry about losing my photos when I get rid of my phone. But because they had never been introduced, and this is my, now, this is my, my theory, because they had not really been introduced to some of this Google stuff, <clears throat> they just were kind of all of a sudden thrown in on the deep end on one of the more kind of creepier things Google can do. And they weren't sort of slowly introduced to it. They didn't see it like be introduced through Google Plus and slowly develop with auto awesome features getting rolled out and like they didn't see the whole evolution of it. They just kind of went in, boom. And it they're like, whoa, this is way too much. And then now they're not gonna use it. And then I thought, could I could you imagine if I told them that their Google web browser was automatically downloading a program in the background that turns on their microphone so that time so that way they can say, okay, Google, what's the weather like? They would think I'm a crazy person. So when I think about it through their perspective, I think, gosh, maybe this has gone way too far. Maybe we are sitting here in the boiling pot just, ah, it's Googs. <clears throat> you know, they mean well. There's just one more thing, right? But hey, they fixed it, right? Now you can opt out. So <laughs> it's just no big deal. And we just keep on going. One more thing, one more. But every now and then, I have like these reality checks where I talk to people outside the tech bubble and I expect them to be like, oh, man, that's great. And they're like, whoa, are you okay with that? Does Jim know you've done that? And I'm like, oh. And I, I felt like, geez, I, I, I didn't really think about that. Like, I had thought about it, but I didn't really, really, really wrap, wrap, wrap my head around it. And then this thing happens. So, Mumble Room, what do you think? Is this the line too far? Sean, I want to start with you. Go ahead. Well, bottom line is anything that can compromise my privacy, I want to be asked first before you add it to my stuff. <laughs> Good point. North Ranger, what do you think? I don't think we should be surprised because uh, we've seen this before with Android, uh, replacing gallery apps, camera apps with uh, the, the closed source uh, Google versions. Well, and that's actually what I was going to ask uh, Wimpy. And the value of this is negative. Uh, is this, once again, RMS being right, or are we overreacting? Is this what we get for using um, a proprietary browser by a advertising company that wants to make life more convenient? But Chromium is not a proprietary um, application, is it? No, but it still happened, didn't it? Yeah, and so um, it probably happened because this is how Chrome is packaged, how Chromium is packaged, because the two are very uh, closely related. But the question here is, is who is the package maintainer? Because if you're using a Linux distribution, ultimately you're placing your trust in the person that makes the binary packages that you install on your system. Because, as I said earlier, for a brief moment, for example, I'm a maintainer for Debian and for Arch Linux. So for a brief moment, I have root on your system. And the question is, do you trust me? And there are a lot of people out there that are in that position. Yeah. So, you know, there are um, processes in place with the distributions and they do things a little bit differently. I think uh, Debian is uh, far more rigorous than uh, some, uh, some of the other distributions in terms of the 
uh, checks and balances that are in place to ensure that the packages are of a suitable quality and they don't do anything, you know, untoward. Um, but yeah, you, you, you take any distribution and ultimately you have to say to yourself for a moment, somebody somewhere created this package and they have root on my system. That's a sobering thought, and I think it's a good perspective for us to take because it is the reality, and it's uh, uh, it, 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 when you think of it in that context, in that perspective, you you can see uh, why uh, there are other other solutions being worked on. Um, and this is yeah, exactly, and this is why things like you know atomic and snappy packages and click packages are becoming a thing because. Um, for example, on Android, when you install an app on your Android phone, that app during the install process does not have root. Hmm. Very good point. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, okay. Uh, in a go-go, I want to give you a chance to say maybe Jim is uh, a lost cause, that him and never having online presence is not possible in 2015. Should I not feel so bad? Well, it's kind of not possible because he could have walked past a shop that is sharing its CCTV camera with an app that you can download on the app store that lets you see CCTV cameras. Sure. So that then means it's been online. <laughs> That's it's true. It's quite hard to avoid <laughs> cameras in, nowadays. <laughs> isn't that all the use the internet. Yeah, isn't that so true? Um, so uh, here's what I wanted to kind of put out there is maybe a feeler. If you go to linuxactionshow.reddit.com, find episode 98 feedback thread. Um... What could I recommend them that they could put on a phone? It'd be great if it supported iOS and Android, so maybe I could use it myself, uh, that would work for backup. So I tried BitTorrent Sync. Eh, it'll copy file program files off, or pictures off. But it's, it's not the same thing to just copy the data as it is to actually have a little intelligence behind it. There's another app out there called Picture Life. This is a private company they were recently bought up that does the same thing that Google Photos does privately. You pay more for it. I don't know. I actually forget. I just was looking at it sort of casually. And uh, it automatically backups your photos, does the face tagging, does sort of like location tagging and tracking, but it's a separate private company. It's not part of an information behemoth. And that's kind of appealing, but I would really like an open source solution for photo backup. Uh, something where, you know, the user can let it run in the background, automatically copy the photos off, sort of like Google Photos does, or BitTorrent Sync, or Dropbox. Or actually, I think, I think there's even a way to do it with OwnCloud. I haven't... Yeah, okay, yeah, Mr. Grumpy R says, yeah, there is a way to do it with OwnCloud. I haven't really played with that. That might be worth playing with, but then see, they'd have to have an OwnCloud server. Yeah, that's a hard one. That is a hard one. I'm not quite sure what the solution is there. Uh, Dropbox will do it as well, as WaffleMaker points out. Uh, now, uh, MiniMC, did you want to point anything else out before we wrap up on the Chromium topic? Yeah, I did that uh, blog post from Debian. And yeah. It looks like Chromium, the Debian part of Chromium, comes without native client module support. Ah. So even if that module was downloaded, it cannot be executed because there is no NACL interpreter. Right. Okay. But besides that, I agree with you. They have gone too far. Yeah. That's not it. I cannot agree with them. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm really stuck. I, I feel like I'm locked into Chrome or Chromium actually, uh, and so I implore the internet until until um, until I switch to GNOME Web fully <laughs> and Lynx and 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 Gedit and all these other programs I'm going to have to like uh, patch together to do what I do with Chromium. Uh, until that moment comes, uh, please internet stay vigilant on this browser. Stay keep 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 them uh, on on watch for me. Let's do a let's do a neighborhood watch on Chromium because I can't go away. I can't quit using it yet. I'm I'm hooked. I'm on the juice. I need to join a program, but until then I'm stuck. I'm stuck. I need your help because uh, that's how I make these shows. There's just some good plugins there. I know Epiphany has no WebGL. I know and Firefox drives me crazy. I'm sorry, I love it, but it drives me crazy. It is a disaster. <sighs> All right, well, if you would have liked to chime in on this conversation, you know, you absolutely could. We have an open mum room. We just check your mics before you come on air, and we really do consider this our virtual Linux users group. Come be part of our vlog, if you will. Head over to jblive.tv on Tuesdays. We do this at 2 p.m. Pacific, and go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get that converted to your local time zone. Also, you can email the show. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar, or go to the subreddit, linuxactionshow.reddit.com. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for tuning this week's episode of Linux Unplugged. We'll see you right here next week for episode 99.
Okay, Google. How do I quit you? Uh. Okay, what do we got here? Let's see. It's got me something. Google actually has an answer for how do I quit you. Let's see what it is. Is it an ad? You have no idea how bad it gets. What? What? <laughs> what is this? I wish I knew how to quit you. <laughs> Wow. Well, thank you. That apparently is its answer as a YouTube clip. Well, uh, I don't know how to quit you, Google. I need you. All right, jbtitles.com. Let's go pick our title, jbtitles.com. Ah, good show, guys. Thanks, you. Thanks, you. Wow, Mimpy, uh, Wimpy, you have a really badass uh, uh, backup uh, strategy there. I was not expecting something so crazy cool. I mean, I guess I should. Uh, well, it's 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 not it's not complicated. If you look at that utility, it's really simple. Yeah. Um, it's got a little. So it's kind of meta because I use MacUp to back up the MacUp backup <laughs> rules, so it restores itself. You know, it's it's quite cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like it. I I, I got I managed to grab the link, so thank you for uh, posting that. And that's a good one. Maybe cool, I almost I almost want to do a whole episode dedicated to people's backup techniques. If we had enough people chiming in that would say they could show up in the mumble room and talk about it, I think I'd be I'd be down for that. I'd be down for that. All right, jbtitles.com, jbtitles.com. Man, is it hot in the studio today? Yes, yes. I you think I'm not going Alex Jones on on Chrome. Come on. Come on, that's a little harsh. Not okay, Google. That is... Wow, that's good. I'm... Wow. Wow. Uh, drawing the line at Google Windows as a second-class citizen. Mac up your Linux. Butterknife Linux containers. Out-of-touch Linux. Hello. Hello, Mr. Puppy. You're just in time. <laughs> yeah. Are we ready to stop? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. Should we do it over again? Let's do it over again. Uh, Spider Oak would be a decent open-source backup thing location. Hmm? The thing that annoys me about Chromium is the fact that they hide that extension. It's an extension, it's an add-on, it's a feature that gets added into Chromium, but the fact is that they don't make it visible in the user interface anywhere. Right. That, well, that, that, is, that is accessible. They're going the to be like in Chromium 45, right? Right. Apparent, apparently it was an a NC, NACL plugin, so that's kind of been depreciated now. Ah. And a go-go, you got this weird buzz on your line. Are you no, coming in over native a native client? Are you coming in over an yeah. analog connection? Yeah, I think it might be me. I might stop talking now. Oh, <laughs> well, it is you. I know that, but I, it, might, it sounds like maybe you have like a little interference on that card or something here. Uh, not okay, Google. I think is our God. It is hot in here. It is so hot in here. All right, not okay, Google. All right, good, good. Well, how are you doing, oh, Mr. Bobby? Uh, oh, sorry, Wimpy. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, Popey, how are you finding the nice cool weather over here at the moment? Oh, it's delightful. Oh, yeah, shut it's up! Really, it's, it's a lovely <laughs> evening, isn't it? Oh, very funny. Now, okay, all right. Now, both of you guys are here. I want to pin you down on this. This is ridiculous. I don't, I don't, I don't know if this is a culture difference or what. But beer and curry, how does that go? How do you do beer and curry? Like, I can understand like beer and, and like fish and chips or beer and burgers, but curry wow. and beer. No. No, it's all massive. of the things you've just listed were wrong. It's obviously yeah. beer and curry. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, either either you have loads and loads of beer and then you get really hungry at the end of the night and you go for a curry, or you go for a curry early in the evening and then you spend the rest of the night having beer. Yeah, but then aren't you having like curry beer beer belches like all the like the entire evening? Like you're belching up curry oh, yeah. and beer? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and in the morning, your wife gets to wake up to the delightful smell of sort of you know beer curry farts. It's uh, you know it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. I'm just Put I'm the, just a uh, toilet roll in the fridge for the next day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the day after, you file for divorce. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and you know we're not we're not animals. It wasn't all beer and curry. We did actually drink a, a vast quantity of Long Island iced tea before we started oh, on good, the beer. Good, good. Oh man. That's a, that's an interesting combo. But no, that's that's uh, that's the culture here. It's um, beer then curry, or curry then beer, or if you're really lucky, beer curry and then more beer after. How do I? I just feel like you're pulling my leg right now. I just feel like you're pulling my leg. I don't. I don't no, no, seriously. No, no, no. It's honestly, seriously, <laughs> that is honestly. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, all right. Chairman's got your back. Required. How does that combo come up, guys? Like I'm not saying they How don't ever go together, but like it seems like you have a limited selection. So I'm I'm usually like I'm the guy that like is like, well, these kind of beers go good with these kind of foods. Are you are you drinking any kind of beer, or are you drinking specific no, well, kinds so of beer? Well, so often, 
if well if it's if it's beforehand then you can drink anything okay you know, okay yeah, yeah favorite is but during curry it's common to drink one of the indian beers be that kingfisher or cobra or one of the other big ones or one of the smaller brands and what but, kind of curry uh, generally is it? a lager it's well any curry okay there's there's so much to choose from Okay. Where we where we went where we went this weekend it was uh, Indian cuisine and Nepalese cuisine oh. so there was quite a selection. No, so I no had garlic be down with that. garlic chili chicken. Oh and yeah, food yeah. You have. yeah. All right, all right. Now now you got my now you got my attention. Uh, you know when when Noah comes out here like we like have to at least once or twice go out to Indian food and I'm not I'm not joking. I've now gone twice and this has been my experience each time. They totally disregard me. And they love Noah. And so much so that, I'm not joking, I ordered something, and the guy's like, no, 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 I won't get you that. Should I get him this instead? And Noah's like, yeah, that'd be good. And he he orders me, the guy orders me something else and makes sure it's okay with Noah first, doesn't even check with me, and changes my order for me. Right. I'm like, oh, I'm like, what? <laughs> okay. I'm like, okay. I, ne- I never look at the menu in a, in a curry house. I pretty much never look at the menu. I just ask them, yeah. what, what's the best yeah. thing you got? Or, yeah. Uh, you know. yeah. yeah, I learned my lesson. I don't even remember what it was. I don't remember what it was. Uh, but you know what? Oh, oh, you know what? I wanted, I wanted, I wanted, oh, that's the other thing, too. I also wanted, uh, what's the flatbread called? You know, that flatbread with the garlic nom. on? Yeah, yeah, nom. Yeah, it's a nom. And uh, so I was like, you know what? I'd also like another piece of nom because I really like the nom, and I don't have like a lot of bread all the time. So I'm like, if I'm gonna have some, I'm gonna go for it. And they're like, no, you don't need it. <laughs> I'm like, but I wanted to eat a lot of it. Like I wanted to indulge, and they're like, no. But I didn't say that part. But he's like, no, you don't need it. I'm like, okay. I I was gonna pay for it. <laughs> I have a I have a friend who, uh, whenever we used to go out for curry, he would always order a naan, and it would always be too much. And he would order always order it anyway because it was a special deal where you know you get the naan thrown in. Yeah. So he would always order it and then take it home in a doggy bag, um, and he would then like eat it when he gets home or the next morning for breakfast. It was delicious. <laughs> Yeah, it is. And although I, I I noticed that we all we all ordered without rice this weekend, mm. and we all just yeah. had curry and naan bread. Yeah, naan is so uh, naan. I really I was surprised when I had it. It's something about it. It's like it's just it was delicious. So I do kind of like going out to have Indian food from time to time. But there's not any really near here the studio because the studio is getting close to Hicktown, and it's kind of like the last remnants of like civilized Hicktown. So there's no Indian cuisine around here. You got to travel. 20 miles either direction and then you then, then you're up to your, your your sack in them but what we got a lot of around this neck of the woods is chinese and thai food thai food's huge around here lots of that so if you're you know if you're in the area all right gentlemen well i think we have our title not okay google i think that's a clever one i love it so i'm gonna get out of here i'm gonna be live tomorrow with tech talk in the morning and uh unfilter in the evening bye mumble room bye guys thanks for coming today Later. Bye, Zane. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.